and welcome to church on this Palm Sunday. It must be said, at least here at Mornington, we're a bit slow to get going this morning. Uh, people are sort of dribbling in uh, after a late night with the election, which we'll talk more about and pray for our, uh, the elected leaders we know of, uh, and we'll, we'll talk more about that as in the service. But it is Palm Sunday, and we're beginning the most special week of the Christian calendar. And part of that, here at Mornington, we've got a, a big new artwork up in the Bob Cure Gallery, and Michael Henderson will be sharing some of that with you today. Uh, also, uh, I'm looking forward to our second part in the series we've embarked on, uh, where we're looking for Jesus in the Old Testament. And brace yourself, we're going to try and cover off the first five books of the Bible in 25 minutes. We'll see how that goes. Uh, but it, it is, I, I'm, I actually, what we'll be talking about today is something that the writer of the message translation of the Bible says has been covered up from Christians in, the, in, our, in our generation, that there's actually been a cover-up. Uh, and I, I actually agree with him. And I think the thing we'll be talking about is the fact that we've covered it up means that we've been able to water down Christianity in a way that makes it a bit ineffective. So we'll talk more about that as we come up to the sermon, but I'm going to pray and we're going to lead into our time of singing and worship uh, with the team at Lena Valley. If you're watching online, I want to say welcome and it's great to have you with us. It'd be great to have your uh, cracker or some bit of bread and, and some juice because we'll, I think it'll be Robin leading us in communion uh, very shortly, but let's just pray. Jesus, as we begin our time together on this Palm Sunday, we remember the moment you came into Jerusalem. Can you help us glimpse who you truly are this morning? And uh, for each one of us, as we arrive emotionally and physically to this time of worship, can you meet us and help us hear your heart for us? We ask that in your name. Amen. So over to you, Robin, and the team. Thank you, Matt. If you're able to stand with us, that'd be so good. Please stand as we sing together. Shout to the Lord. Break out in praise and sing for joy. Make a joyful symphony before the Lord, the King. Let the sea and everything in it shout His praise. Let the earth and all living things join in. Let the rivers clap their hands in glee and let the hills sing out their songs of joy before the Lord. Did you hear the mountains tremble? Did you hear the oceans roar? When the people rose to sing of Jesus Christ
feel the darkness tremble when all the saints join in one song and all the streams flow as one river to wash away our brokenness and we can see that God you're moving a time of jubilee together this morning we're going to celebrate communion um, so if you love the Lord then Jesus invites you to participate here or at Mornington online we welcome you now's a moment to prepare the little uh, little element rip off the top the, the top and we're going to take some time share some scripture readings and some songs together In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God, and God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created. His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. He came into the very world that he created, but the world did not recognize him. He came to his own people and even they rejected him. But to all who believed and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs the forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior.
the message we heard from Jesus. And now declare to you, God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are light. 
If we say we have fellowship with God but go on living in spiritual darkness, we are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. The Apostle Paul taught us about communion. Let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper, he wrote, and why it is so centrally important. I received my instructions from the Lord himself and passed them on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread. Having given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this to remember me. Let's eat the bread together. After supper, he did the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, the new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. Let's drink the cup together. must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup you reenact in your words and actions the death of the Lord you will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the Lord Jesus returns to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say oh my God you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me here I am so here I am to worship Um, oh, that's loud. My name's Dan. I'm one of the pastors here, and I have a very bad memory, so I need my phone. Um, I'm quite excited because I've seen what's out at the back room at Lena Valley. Should we keep it a secret? Uh, we've got a little birthday lunch after church today. So if you're from Lena Valley, or if you're really fast from Mornington, um, <laughs> then you can come and help Jenny celebrate her 80th birthday. So coming on Tuesday. What's that, Mitch? Did you say 80? <laughs> no, it's not. Okay. All right. Um, we've got a very exciting month coming up. We've got quite a bit going on. So you ready? Next Friday is the um, Good Friday service here at 10 a.m. At, at Lena Valley. So if you'd like to come along, it's a more reflective, quiet, 
just it's really significant and important to keep Christ at the centre of Easter and not to let family and holidays take over if you can. So come along and be with us on, on Good Friday. Um, on Easter Sunday at 7am, which is a very reasonable hour, we're setting up a, um, there'll be a fire pit. We're actually setting up an art sort of construction of an empty tomb on the beach. Um, so come along and it'll just, sometimes it's really helpful not just to hear words all the time, but to actually contemplate and see physical things. So to, to actually sit in front of this open tomb at the beautiful sunny beach of Bell Reeve is going to be a beautiful morning. So 7 o'clock at Bell Reeve, um, and that'll be a 50-minute service so that you've got time to get off to your other things that you need to do. But if you've got some spare time, St Mark's have invited anyone up for hot cross buns after that. There are hot cross buns on Friday as well. Um, we'll probably have them Saturday at home. Um, there's the week after that. So then Easter Sunday service is a 10 a.m. service as normal. Uh, so, so come along to either Lena Valley or Mornington for, for the service. Um, the following week, we're having a baptism here. David's been preparing the baptismal and repainting it and fixing it, getting it all neat and tidy um, for Anya, who's going to be baptised on the 7th. So it's very exciting here. Um, we'll probably have a picnic in a p- local park afterwards just to, to celebrate, but we'll work that out. Um, okay, and then coming up after that, we've got dinner together starting up in end of April. So you've got a month to get ready for it. This week, you'll be able to sign up um, at the citywide website, citywide.org.au slash dinner hyphen together, and you'll be able to sign up for your dinner together. We'll email around as well. Uh, and dinner together for the, for the seven months of this year when we're doing it will be in the same region each time. So you won't move around and meet all different sorts. You'll actually meet people who live, Christians who live near you and others. It's one of the best missional things that we do because you can invite anyone to it and it's just anyone will feel at home and loved at a dinner together. So the, the way it works is you, you bring along your food and share it together and the host brings dessert. But a beautiful chance to, to meet some local Christians and we've invited other, other Baptist churches around the south to come along as well. So you'll hopefully be rubbing shoulders with other Baptists and I'm sure you'll get on. Okay, so, so that's coming up. We're quite excited about that. And if you haven't been to a dinner together, really encourage you to get involved. It's a, it's a beautiful way to meet people. Um, okay, and then following that, we've got uh, Anzac Day. Is that exactly a month from today? No, almost. Okay, so down um, at the park at John Turnbull Park at Lena Valley, we're going to love and bless this local community. We've been working with the RSL, getting ready for it. So that's going to be coming up in a month's time. Um, All right, and then the last thing I'll talk about before handing... I'm I'm quite excited about hearing Michael Henderson's artwork. If, especially here at Lena Valley, if you haven't been to Mornington, you've got three weeks, three or four weeks, to have a look at his... They're really big, life-sized, big pictures, and they're they're stunning. I'd encourage you to grab... Just go and stand there and really soak it in for a bit. We'll hear about that in a sec. But the last thing I want to talk about is we've got the Foundations course starting on the 1st of May... Um, and I'm going to sneeze in a minute, that's what's going on. On the, on the 1st of May, starting, and it's a 14-week program, but we're going to have like three weeks on, then a week off, then three weeks on, week off, so that you can still meet together in your home groups um, and go on school holidays, whatever. Um, but we'd really encourage you either to do the Hobart Baptist course, which will be in, at lunchtime, midday, or to join the Mornington course, which will be the evenings, and there's, a, there's one weekend where we'll do it all together. So join the two together. So we'd really love you to join the foundations, either as a whole home group. Um, you really benefit from going through the, that depth of discipleship and applied theology. Um, I can pretty much, I can guarantee, I think. I can, no, I can guarantee you're going to love it. Okay? It's a really important course, um, just helping you to know what it means to be a disciple of Christ. So starting 1st of May in one month. All right, I'm going to hand over to Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, mate. Uh, just before Michael comes to introduce you to his artwork, which is really timely for this Easter week, just want to acknowledge that we had an election yesterday uh, and we'll be working out what it all means for the next couple of weeks. Uh, but what it clearly means is there is a modern uh, tendency at the moment in politics Political, in the political world to say the other party are the enemy and 
and we can't get on with them and you really need to vote for us because we've got the way, the truth and the life. Uh, it's clear that Tassie will be in trouble if our politicians try and do that. They're going to need to work out how to work together, which is wonderful. But they're going to need our prayers. I was going to pray briefly. Renata will also pray for them a little later in the service. But please be praying for our political leaders. It is a significant thing. Uh, and it's been interesting for me watching from the inside what it all means. Uh, it was my first time in the tally room, in Australia's last tally room. It's a fascinating experience. Anyway, but let's just pray briefly and then I'll invite Michael up. So, Jesus, uh, for the first time in this service, but not the last time, we want to, we want to ask for your wisdom and guidance uh, for our elected leaders, some of whom don't yet know that that's what they're going to be. Uh, we pray for Andrew Hawkey and the Tasmanian Electoral Commission as they work through the process of getting the details right on our behalf. Uh, and then for our leaders, we pray that you'll help them work out how to work together for the benefit of our state. And uh, we have a sense that they're going to need your help. So please, Jesus, give them what they're going to need. And we ask that in your name. Amen. I'm going to invite Michael up now. Uh, Michael's a friend of mine who's part of the leadership team for the Baptist Union in Tasmania, also happens to be an artist. And uh, this is uh, the, the three, is it, or is it four? Four, four. four, four panels we out, have out there are part of a, a much larger exhibition. Yeah. But do you want to tell us a bit about what we've got out there? Love to. Thanks, Matt. Good morning, everyone. We all got lots of sleep last night, yeah, after staying up to watch the election. I stayed up until Jeremy Rockcliffe made his speech. <laughs> yeah, if you know when that happened. Anyway, I digress. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, also, I'm here probably with two hats on, or like in that sense, I am part of the Taz Baptist Network and um, leadership group. So part of my role is to support churches and leaders and pastors to... Thrive. Let's just say thrive. And then also I have some other work that I do where I get to sit around and draw all day or paint until my hand starts to cramp. I think that's the definition of like doing art quite a bit, yeah? When your hand... I get this pinky finger cramps eventually because I must rest it against things and hold it out. Anyway, I um, about 10 years ago, um, I should also say that I'm married to Tiffany and we live in Tasmania and we have two kids and moved here five years ago and almost five years to the day, but there you go. Um, where was I? About ten years ago, that's right, I, uh, I wanted to do something about faith more than Easter. I wanted to do something for faith to sort of describe something of my journey with God and faith, and what it meant to me. I didn't necessarily want to describe events. I didn't want to illustrate Bible passages. You know, I didn't want to just say, this thing happened, and then this thing happened, and then this thing happened, and here's some drawings to just walk you through some timeline. But I did want to tell some big story. And thinking about that, and then also thinking about my personal journey, and then also factoring in some of the conversations that I was having with people that weren't close to Jesus. I started with the three images that are out there of Jesus and Peter and Judas on either side of him. Can we have those image, that image on the screen? So these, um, Dan said that these are life-size. They're not actually life-size. They're actually bigger than life-size. <laughs> They're quite big people. Um, Someone asked me the other day, how did I draw them? I pinned them to my fence and walked along and sketched onto that and then took them inside and drew them one at a time. Can I have those images back? So this image for me is, as I said, it's personal. And I think this is the way faith is meant to be, yeah? I'm not trying to describe something that's just out there or a story or something that happened in history. I'm actually trying to describe something that means something to me because I think Jesus did something that's not just meaningful but makes a difference to my life and how I live my life 
and then how he empowers me to live a life. I get a benefit from being with Jesus. So I'm trying to do all of those things, yeah? So in this three panel, on the far left is Peter and on the far right is Peter. And the person that's beside Jesus either side is Judas. So they're repeating characters. It's telling a story. Yeah, you with me so far? It's not too arty-farty? No, good. (laughs) So Jesus is in the centre, and this is centering on his crucifixion. So Jesus' hand on the right-hand side is a shocked hand. It's describing that Jesus has just been nailed to the cross. And on the right-hand side, it's a limp, dead hand, describing that this is after his death. Yeah? And then we have the two characters there. Identify very powerfully with both, I think, me personally. Because I've been in their position. I've been in their position both before I became a follower of Jesus and I've been in their position after I became a follower of Jesus. And what I mean by that is that there have been moments in my life when I have felt very far away from God and haven't even been able to really sense where he is around me or if he even exists. And there have been moments in my life when I felt so close to Jesus that I felt like I could touch him if I just reached out far enough, that I could talk to him, that I could hear him. You know, that intimacy, yeah? And so I invest all of those emotions into these characters. So Peter on the far left... It's not just that Peter denies Jesus. I'm trying to describe there him turning his back physically to his friend. And same for Judas. Judas walked with him for three years, intimate relationship. And in a moment, he sells Jesus out. And for me... I've been in that position where I've turned my back on Jesus so powerfully that I've gone, I want nothing to do with you anymore. And in that moment, Jesus doesn't say to me, get lost. He waits patiently for me to turn around. So on the far right-hand side, I've got two responses. And probably the one that's most powerful, I think, is Peter not claiming something, he's not championing now his faith out into what you might read in Acts. He's just holding his hand out to try and get a benefit from Jesus' blood that he shed. I'm trying to describe that so close that he could almost put his hand out and feel an almost dried up drop of blood touch his hand. I say all this because I really want people to have an emotional, personal response to Jesus. I'm not trying to describe a Bible story that you can read. I'm trying to describe a real and present God that doesn't just want to know you, but wants to help you, support you. He's not going to turn his back on us even when we do it to him. So then the last image, if I can just have that one up. There's four out there, and this is the fourth one that's out the, out there in the foyer, and it's of Mary. And what I'm trying to describe here is just my reaction, and I realise I'm not female, but just go with me. Yeah, I've invested my emotions into the female character of Mary, and I'm describing how I would react, I think, if... I had felt Jesus had died and he had been put in the tomb. And picture the story, yeah? Three days he hasn't got up. (laughs) I know he said he might get up, but for three days... It's hard to believe, yeah, that he's going to get up, is what I imagine. I would find it hard to believe he's going to get up and come out of the tomb. And so then she sees him, and then this is what I'm trying to describe. My very human, emotional reaction to seeing Jesus. And I invested into Mary... And that's what I draw. I think of these things as I sing the songs this morning. You know, I don't want to just sing songs. Beautiful lyrics, but 
You know, I don't want to just go through the tune and say the words. I'm trying to invest something of myself into those things so that when I say the word salvation, I'm thinking through what does it mean and I'm doing the same thing when I draw a picture like this. What is this for me? If I was to draw Jesus this morning, how would I draw him? Not copy how others do it, but how would I do it? What would I want to say to Jesus? How would I want to describe him to someone else? If you do that with your life, don't just copy the words that are written in Scripture and don't just copy the way someone else says it. And don't try to get it right in that sense, but just say from your heart, Jesus means this to me this Easter. I think that would be a powerful thing for all of us to do. I have exhibited this in a number of places. As I said, it's 10 years um, ago that I did the whole 16 drawings and they've been exhibited in lots of different places around Australia. One of the most powerful was when it was exhibited in Adelaide as part of the Adelaide Fringe Festival. And just so many people having the most random, to me, random encounters with God about some of the drawings that I wouldn't have thought were much, but they've seen a lot. And then people coming way closer to Jesus in those moments. You know, it's a great thing to be a part of. I'm not championing art, although I'd love you to do art more. But I am championing owning your faith, investing something of yourself into it, and then sharing that with others. Thanks, Matt. Well, thanks, everyone. <laughs> Do I, I throw it to the song, yeah. We're going to sing it with heart, whatever this song is, yeah? I don't know what it is, but... <laughs> um, Invest something of yourself into this song, please. I'll try to do the same. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Please stand if you're able to. Be lifted high.
Morning, I'm Renata and I'm going to be bringing you a prayer and the Bible reading for the day. Um, but just before I pray, I'd like to point out something that you know I found helpful at a previous election is one of the stalls, as well as the normal democracy sausage, because of course I go and find which polling place is going to have those before I pick where I'm going to vote. Um, this one was a school and their gardens decided some of their students packaged up seeds and I went... Well, I'm going to buy myself a packet of seeds because the future brings good things as long as I plant them to make them happen. So I'd re advise if you're feeling, you know, whatever you're questioning about it, go and buy a packet of seeds. Plant something that will spark joy because it is you who is going to make the difference that you want to see. So first we'll pray. Father God, we thank you that we can come here today to celebrate your glory and um, hear about... I'm sorry, I've lost my brain words. Um, to celebrate your glory, to hear from your word and to really look in depth at who you are and what you want for us. We pray that you'll guide us as we go about our daily lives to you know, reflect your glory and grace, to share your love and to make good decisions for our communities. We pray for our political leaders who definitely need it at the moment as we have an election which is going to disappoint a surprisingly high number of people, whatever the results end up finally being as counting is done. Um, we pray that you'd guide those who get elected to be making the best choices for our community and for those who are supporting them to make the best choices for how to support things to take care of those truly in need in our communities. We pray that you guide each one of us as we're interacting with those around us, that we can reflect your love and grace and be honest and, in, you know, demonstrate integrity as we go about what you're calling us to do. Amen. Now, the Bible reading for today is from Exodus 34. We're reading um, verses 5 to 7. And I'm reading from the ESV version, but you can read in whatever makes you happy. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation.
Amen. Thanks, Renata. Uh, I just want to point out that the beautiful flowers behind me uh, left from the memorial service we had for Ed Stratzma. And it was beautiful, wasn't it, Henny? And uh, let's keep praying for the Stratzma family. As uh, I know personally, it takes a bit to, to process if you lose someone who's close to you. We're into our second uh, sermon in this wrestle with this moment where Jesus is on the road to Emmaus as after his resurrection and he, he's, he's showing the disciples from the Old Testament all that it said about him. And if you, like me, have read your Old Testament, you won't find the name Jesus uh, obviously there. And I've often, I, I remember thinking, gee, I would, I would love to have heard what he was saying there. But we're trying to work out, if we were to look at our Bibles, what might he have shown them? And so last week we looked at the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible. Now, important to understand that for Jewish people, they, they call the first five books of the Bible the books of Moses. They, the, they call that the, the Torah, uh, and it is kind of the, the, the sense is that Moses helped pen them all. A little complicated to explain how he wrote about his own death in that, uh, but, but that they are called the books of Moses. And so when uh, Jesus talks about Moses and all the prophets, he means the first five books of the Bible, Bible and then the, the books that come after that. Now, Genesis starts with this dilemma we spoke about last week. That's true for all of us. This incredible truth that there's, part, there's a beautiful part of you created in the image of God, but there's also part of you that's pretty messy. And both of those are who you are. And so we see this dilemma right the way through the Bible. For all human beings, there's two sides to us. A, part, a beautiful spirit, the human spirit, created in the image of God, and a messy part. And we then see in the book of Genesis, uh, God reaching out for relationship despite the fall and despite the brokenness. And so from chapters 4 to 11, we see the story of the sad story of Cain and Abel, Noah and the Tower of Babel. Chapters 12 to 36 is really the story of the promise. It's the story of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And Jacob gets another name. Who knows what Jacob's other name is? Israel. And so it's Jacob's kids that become the 12 tribes, kind of. Well, it's actually 10 of Jacob's kids and then two of Joseph, his, young, his, his son's kids. They, two of his sons sort of get a Guernsey uh, as then they become the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, Abraham is a rich man with a big family and, jo and Jacob is a rich man with a big family. And so what God does in order uh, to make sure that we and they no, it's not about them being rich and having a big family. Uh, he takes them off into Egypt. In one of the first descriptions of God's grace that we see happen in the Bible, and I, I call this like divine judo. In Genesis 50, uh, Joseph says to his brothers, you intended to hurt me. But God took what you intended for bad and turned it for good. In Judo, you take the force of your enemy and apply it against them. And you'll see this as the pattern right the way through the Bible. The devil will do his worst. People will do their worst. And somehow God is able to take the mess and turn it into something beautiful. So, uh, Jacob's family, Israel's tribes end up in Egypt and they end up in Egypt for, listen to this, 430 years. So any sense of them being rich and powerful is completely taken away. 
and they are slaves in Egypt. To give us some kind of reference point, obviously Australia, white Australia, is a lot younger than 430 years. Uh, So for us to get some kind of reference point, that's the same as from the the time they arrive in Egypt to the time they leave Egypt, it's the the same as today, back to the year William Shakespeare released his first ever play. That give you some kind of reference, uh, back to the year 1594. As a 30-year-old, he released his first play called Titus Andronicus. Uh, And the way they talked back there and the way they thought back there, that's as far back as for the Israelite people in Egypt. And so, one of the things that is absolutely clear, if you hang around Tassie, we we tried a social experiment and we put, uh, we created housing estates where we put all the people who are on welfare in the same community and we thought we'd see what would happen. Well, we discovered what would happen. Uh, Those communities become more and more disadvantaged and Here in Tassie, there are generations who have been unemployed and without a job and with family troubles because that's been passed down from generation to generation. Imagine how you would think about yourself, what your self-picture would be, if not only your parents were slaves, but your grandparents were slaves. Now, imagine that goes back for 430 years. I don't know how many generations that is. That's a couple of generations. How that would affect your self-picture. One of the things we see, so the first, we now move to the book of Exodus and the first 18 chapters of Exodus are about the uh, Moses coming and leaving, helping the Israelites leave Israel. A case could be put, that the rest of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy are about helping the Israelites get to the point where not only have they physically left Egypt, but they've actually emotionally left Egypt, that Egypt has left them. Now, I, I wonder for you, one of the challenges we all face, we all face this double-edged reality of the fact that there's a good part, a part of us that just loves God and wants to love people. There's another side to us. One of the, the other challenges you face is you, like the Israelites, have inherited things from your family, from the previous generations. There are things you believe because of generations that have gone before you. Sometimes it's from your family, sometimes it's from your culture and your society, but there are things you, that have been passed down to you that were not true. Have there been times in your life when you've realised that things you inherited were not true? Have, have there been? Because we want to put ourselves in the, the, in the shoes of Israel at this point. And we're going to do a, a Mentimeter, which is one of the things we do here, we, we want your opinion or, or your view, and I'd love you to think about what are some of the wrong beliefs that were passed down to you that you now realise are not helpful? What are some of the wrong beliefs that you now realise are not helpful? And if you're at home, we'd, lo- we'd love you to be participating in this at, L- at Lena Valley. We're going to chuck the slide up now, Matt, so people can use you, this QR code What wrong or unhealthy beliefs are passed down to you by previous generations? If you use that QR code, it'll take you to this question. I really invite you to think about what are the things from previous generations that you need to leave behind? Because God said to Abraham he was going to choose these people, but in order to do that, he had to help them find a new identity. So you can... Everybody... Been able to access that QR code? Now, what, what wrong beliefs have been passed down? Be good to stop and think about that. So can you think of anything where you go, I realise, you know, one of the things that you, you may have discovered is that it's okay to dance now. Uh, or, or if you're a Baptist, because <laughs> there was a time. We, you want, what sort of answers are we starting to get, Matt? Let's have a look. What wrong or unhealthy beliefs 
His name, work is who I am. Always be perfect. Intolerance, racism, eye for an eye. It's, this is so imp- important to, to stop and think, what are the things that were passed down to you that you actually need to free yourself from? Really helpful. Thank you for those that have answered this so far. Essentially, racism's come up eye for an eye. The environment cleans itself. It'd be convenient if that was true, but, you know, binary thinking, intolerance, conform, perfectionism. Really helpful to see these. We are all on a journey to become free. We are all on a journey to become free. And what we see in the Old Testament is the God of the universe reaching for relationship and trying to form a people for himself. And so, uh, what we'll need, so uh, the, the Easter Bunny, somebody put that there as a wrong belief that was passed down to them. Fair enough. Uh, We're going to leave that, and the link to the results of this is in the YouVersion Bible app, so you can then, that's helpful, we can check it, I don't have anybody to read it at that size, but it's, uh, it's kind of cool to see the answers still coming in. Thanks, Matt. And so, God uses Moses to bring the Israelites out of Egypt, and it's clear, he gets them to a point where it's absolutely clear that it's not because they're rich or clever. The only way they leave Egypt is because God intervenes. And one of the dangers for us is we can think our task is to be rich and clever and to earn God's favour. One of the, sto- the story of the Bible is very clear. It is God who intervenes. And then we see in the book of Exodus, God giving a, a new mission statement sort of a a renewal of the covenant he gave to Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob. Now he says in Exodus, this is to Moses, now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites, is what God tells Moses. So up to chapter 18 in Exodus, there's a story of leaving Egypt. And now God says, okay, now you've left, let's talk about what you need to become. And interestingly enough, this is a historic text in human history. This passage in Exodus chapter 19 is one of the first times in the whole of human history that there is any kind of monotheism. Up till now, there is a sense, uh, and you'll see often in the Old Testament, this sense that God is the the toughest out of all the gods. But here, God is kind of letting Israel know, hey, boys and girls, the whole earth is mine. I'm in charge. Those other gods, they're not real, is, is what... So, in human history, this little passage here is historic... More than that, though, there are some words in there that carry profound meaning. The word, a kingdom, the idea that they would be a kingdom of priests. A kingdom, as we've talked about before, is a place where a king is in charge. God had sent them off to Egypt for 430 years to bring them out in order that they would know that it's not about them being rich and clever, it's about them following his will, them following the king, a kingdom of priests. Now, within Israel, there were priests. There were priests that were there to serve Israel, but all of Israel were to be priests. And what is a priest? A priest is somebody who represents God to the people and the people to God. So all of Israel were to represent God to the world. They were not there for themselves. We said this last time. One of the dangers for all of us is we get a bit self-focused and we think we're special. Sorry, I dropped the microphone. Uh, And uh, what 
God wants Israel to know is, yes, you are my chosen people, but to be my kingdom of priests, to represent me to the world, not to be there to, you know, enjoy the warm hugs from me, and to represent the world, to represent me to the world and represent the world to me. And he says, you will be a holy nation, a nation that is set apart, which is what holiness actually means. Sometimes, again, we get the wrong picture of holiness. We think it's sort of halos and shining and stuff. Holiness means being set apart. And God said, I have set you apart to be my representatives on the planet to show people what hope looks like. And so, This is kind of the mission statement and then in chapter 20, he begins explaining to them what that means and we get the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 and he he unpacks that further and Exodus uh, sort of from 25 to 30 starts telling them what does it mean for him to be king, then it's interesting in chapter 31, we get the importance of Sabbath. He, he's already talked about Sabbath in the Ten Commandments, but and, and we've talked a bit about this. We've got a couple of sermons online on YouTube to go back and watch. It is so important to have a day off, is what, is what Sabbath actually means. If you are not able to have a day off, then what you're saying in your actions is the world can't survive without you being in charge and taking action that the world can't survive without you being in charge and taking action. And so, having a day off is an, is an act of faith. And so, we see the Sabbath spoke, uh, spoken about in chapter 31, and then in chapter 32 through to 34, we see Moses' terrible, very bad day. Uh, that's not exactly how it goes. What is that awful, terrible, very bad? There's a book about somebody's terrible, very bad day. Moses has one of those. You imagine you go up and have this incredible time with God, hear from God and get from God the secret to a healthy and whole life. And he gets it on tablets. And you come back down the mountain and the, the bloke you thought you needed to help you, Aaron has let the people lose the plot and they've built a calf in their own image and they, they're worshipping this calf and Moses gets so frustrated that he gets these Ten Commandments, he gets the, the Word of the Law given to him by God and smashes them into a million bits. And then he has to trudge back up the mountain and say, have you got another copy? And so, we actually, at that point, get to this moment where God kind of says, oh, you guys are pretty frustrating. I'd like to not, you know, to get, I'm tempted to give up. What say we give up on Israel and we'll just have a crack with you and your family, Moses? Moses says, no, 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 I, I need you to be with us and I can't do this without you and, I, and it would be not good for your name if we don't bring the whole of Israel with us. And he says to God, I, I, I don't want to do this without you. Have you ever had moments like that? I, I don't think I can do this. And then he says this line, now show me your glory. I said at the start of the service that I agree with Eugene Peterson, who says there's actually been a cover-up in the Christian church. This is what Eugene Peterson actually says. He says, one of the severe handicaps under which the church operates is the cover-up of the glory with respectable substitutes such as acceptance and honour, success and relevance. Over and over again, we miss it. If you were to think about the word glory, because it comes up in some of our songs and it's, it's very common in the, the New Testament, the word glory, what pictures come to mind for you with the word glory? What, what, what pictures? 
shout it out. I'd like to hear, I can't quite hear Lena Valley. It'll be hard to hear those online. But for those here at Mornington, what pictures come to mind when you think of the word glory? Sovereignty. Sovereignty. Yep. God's sovereignty. For others, what pictures come to mind? If you think of the word glory, if you were to think about how you would use the word glory. Radiance, yeah, and dies sort of power, radiance, yeah, light. That, that's, that's kind of our common understanding. But actually, those words don't really capture what the Bible means when it uses the word glory. See, Moses says, show me your glory. And what we get is Exodus chapter 34. You see, if we were to think of Power, radiance, glory. This is Palm Sunday. You know, you'd think that Palm Sunday was the moment when Jesus was most glorified, when everybody's sort of clapping and cheering, going, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now, save now. You would think that would be the moment where Jesus was most glorified, wouldn't you? But there is actually another moment when Jesus says, now is the Son of Man glorified. He had quite a different understanding of what glory meant. And do you know what that moment was? the moment when his best friend betrays him. The moment when his best friend betrays him in John 13, 31. How can Palm Sunday not be when Jesus is glorified and this dark, sad moment when your best friend is betraying you be the moment where God's glory is revealed? I, I really believe we in the Christian church have watered down the gospel because we've avoided this path part of the Bible. Um, we're gonna, we talk a lot more. I'm not going to get the chance to, to really unpack God's glory. We spend a lot more time unpacking it in the foundations course. I believe it is one of the most important bits of Bible teaching to understand. It will affect not only your understanding of who Jesus is and what he did, but it gives you a, a path to a healthy life, a healthy family, a healthy workplace. The glory of God is one of the most important things to understand. And it is actually what we see, it is the most important part of the Old Testament. Just a couple of verses in Exodus chapter 35, 34. Let's have a look at them. Exodus 34 verses 5 to 7. Renata read them. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of his parents to the third and fourth generation. So, what is it? What is this? This is Exodus 34. And I'm, I'm telling you, do you know this? The reason I say this is the most important part of the Old Testament, because it is the few verses in the Old Testament that are most quoted by the Old Testament. You'll see these pattern of words coming up in the Psalms and in Isaiah and right the way through the Old Testament. They'll refer back to this and it's quoted in pretty remarkable ways in the New Testament too. So it's, it's clearly not light, is it? It's clearly not radiance. It, what, is, what is this? If you look at this passage of the Bible, what is it? You see, it is more than the fullness. It is God's character. It's what matters to God. And one of the challenges is it's multidimensional. Many of us have a one-dimensional God, either a gentle Jesus, meek and mild, or a, a God who you've got to fit the boxes for and not you know, get in trouble from. What we have here is a beautiful few verses that talk about the, com the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love. We also get this thing at the end that says he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. 
Many of us want a one-dimensional God, but you cannot follow the God of the universe and have a one-dimensional God. What we see here, God's glory, His revelation of who He is and what He cares about, is His love and His justice together. They're both. We see His mercy and compassion, and it's beautiful, but it's also balanced by His justice. Both of those are who God is. And if you try and make God a one-dimensional God that is only loving and merciful but not just, or only just and not loving and merciful, then it's not God. We find it hard, many of us tend to be either justice people or mercy people. We find it hard to, you know, manage both, but we, we water down the gospel when we try and fit God into a one-dimensional picture. God is both love and truth. He's not love or truth. And so we get this incredible picture of the glory of God revealed to Moses. And the rest of Exodus is the story of them building the tabernacle so the glory of God can hang out with them, the presence of God can hang out with them. And the end of the book of Exodus is this incredible story of the, the glory of God coming to be with them. And one of the things we need to hear in this is we get the law, we get the picture of what it means. But what sets these people apart is that God wants to hang out with them. He wants to do life with them. He wants to be with them. And so the glory comes and hangs out with the people of God. And then we have the, the book of Leviticus, which tells you some of the laws. And there's many, many ways in which Jesus comes and fulfills Leviticus. And I'm sure Jesus would have referred to that. But we're not going to go there this morning. And he also, uh, we also have the book of Numbers, which has a whole lot of numbers, but it also tells a lot of the story of the journey of the people of Israel. And then we get to the book of Deuteronomy. Now, remember, Moses, when he starts his journey at the start of Exodus, tells God, I can't talk real well. Uh, so you better find someone who knows how to talk. And then we get the longest recorded sermon in history from Moses, which is Deuteronomy. And it's towards the end of his life, just as he's looking over the promised land, knowing they're getting close, the older generation have died off. And he's trying to prepare this next generation and he tells them the important stuff. And one of the things he says is, there's someone coming. And I'm sure Jesus quotes uh, this, Deuteronomy 18, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. He goes on and says, this is God talking now to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites and I'll put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I've commanded him. I myself will call to account anyone who doesn't listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. So this is Moses at the end of his life saying, someone's coming. Someone's coming and when he comes, you better listen to him. And a whole lot of prophets do come, but for Israel there's always this sense that there's this prophet to come who's going to fully and completely represent God's words. And one of the other things we need to understand, we're going to encounter this more as we get to Ezekiel, this incredible glory of God, the presence of God, the character of God that fills the temple. There's a tragic part of the book of Ezekiel where it leaves. It rises and leaves. And although they build another temple, there is no story of the glory coming back in that second temple. And Israel is both looking for a prophet who's going to come and, and looking for the one who's going to be a bit like Moses, but they're also waiting for the temple, the glory to come back. 
And I am sure this is what Jesus is telling them on the road to Emmaus. And I don't know if he dictates this directly to John. But did you know that John in John 1.14 actually directly quotes Exodus 34? In the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, which was what John had available to him, he directly quotes Exodus 34. And what he says about who Jesus is, is this, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The word there for dwelling is the word literally tabernacle. The Word became flesh, Jesus becomes flesh and makes his dwelling among us. He hangs out with us. We have seen his what? We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. That where he's quoting grace and truth is a direct quote from the Septuagint from Exodus 34. John goes on to finish this description of who Jesus is and what he did by saying, out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses and grace and truth truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. You don't understand who Jesus is and what he was about until you begin to glimpse the impact of the glory of God and understand that on the cross, the full weight of God's justice meant the incredible beauty of his mercy and compassion. And in his life, Jesus made the glory of God visible. And we are called to live from that same justice and mercy and compassion that Jesus exhibited. But Paul writes in Colossians, it's not by working hard. It's not by sorting it out. One of the things that becomes incredibly obvious is... Israel could not do it on its own. And we can't do it on, its own, on our own. They needed the presence of God with them. But it wasn't until the prophet that Moses was pointing to, the, the glory that they were longing for would come. And when Jesus comes to the temple, he comes as the glory they're longing for. But he's not in the shape of a cloud. He's in the shape of the Son of God whose death takes away the sins of the world. And Paul writes and he says, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. As Christians, we are called to an additional tension beyond the human tension that we all have. We all have a human tension, that is, there's a human spirit created in the image of God and there's a mess and a darkness and we can be full of ourselves and full of it. That's all human beings. As followers of Jesus, we are called, as the Westminster Confession says, the chief end of man is to glorify God. What does that mean? It means that we are to live in the tension of justice and mercy and compassion. And you don't get to do an either or. 
And what makes, one of the things that we will show you in Foundations is what makes a family work, what makes a government work, as our politicians are about to find out, is justice and mercy and compassion. You can't do either or. But as a human being, you can't resolve that tension. As Christians, we are called to live in the tension and the only way it gets resolved on this side of eternity is in the shape of a cross. We're invited to take up our crosses. Live cross-shaped lives and glorify God tangibly, be agents of God's justice, his boundaries and his mercy and his compassion. As a follower of Jesus, I hate to break the news to you, there is no one you're not called to love. That can be really difficult. But the other side of that is that love should never be a collapsing of boundaries. That love must always respect the individual and respect the separateness of the other. And I'd love to spend more time talking about this and it's a theme right the way through the New Testament. But what John says, it's through Jesus... that God is made known. It's through Jesus that God's glory is visible. And what we'll be showing you in the Foundations course, that the glory of God genuinely is the best hope your family has, is the best hope our government has, the best hope our church has. And it's going to require you to be ready to take up a cross. Let's pray. Jesus, I've got no idea what Mo went through Moses' mind when he said, show me your glory. And on behalf of the Christian church, I want to apologise. I think we've distanced ourselves from the idea of your justice and mercy and compassion because it's confronting. It's easier to want to, you know, seek justice for people we don't like or to look for mercy and compassion for ourselves. It's easier to want to collapse you and, and the Father into like a, a, a one-dimensional God. You don't let us get away with that. You come as a person, a three-dimensional person into history. And you say, if you want to follow me, you need to get ready to die to yourself and take up your cross. Thank you that your glory, your justice, mercy and compassion is the foundation of the world. It is how this world works. Thanks that there is a, a path to life and a path to healthy families and communities. But Jesus, can you help us? Can you help us face the stuff in us that would hold us back from justice, that would hold us back from care and love? And would seek to reduce the world to black and white and the problem being out there. Help us, help us know how much you love us. Jesus, help us glimpse what that cross meant. So that we can truly glorify you. As Paul said, it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We need your help. Amen. We're going to sing one more song. Please stand with us if you're able to.
Those last, that last line, you know, it's not us saying to God, you'll be forever mine. It's God saying to us, you will be forever mine. Let's close our service as we do each week, saying the Lord's Prayer together as it appears up on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Our service is over. Please take some time to have a cup of coffee and a really lovely time of fellowship with, with um, each other as you, um, as you finish the service today. Um, and if you would like some prayer, I know there are people who would love to pray with you. If you just want to stay in your seat or if you want to come down to the front and sit on the front, um, someone will come to you. Someone will find you and pray with you this morning. God bless you as you go into the week. My chains are gone.